it was, uh, this was now 35 years ago, was quite a bit smaller. Several dozen PhD level scientists were placed in offices on Capitol Hill, personal offices, committee offices, House, Senate, uh, by mutual agreement, you know, there'd be kind of a, 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 a Greek rush uh, to find out who will take you and where you would like to work. It's now 45 years, a very effective program, and it's grown so that now each year, AAAS, where I'm now the head, little did I know back then when I signed up for this program that I would be running AAAS decades later, but we now place 270 PhD level scientists in all three branches of the federal government for a one-year fellowship. It's a great program. It's to bring, it originally was conceived to bring technical expertise to the policy making process. It was a bunch of scientists who were sitting around saying, well, we scientists know a lot. <laughs> and these policy makers are doing some pretty stupid things. Maybe we can bring some scientific expertise. Well, in fact, um, that benefit has come uh, over the years, and now there are several dozen scientists each year who work in the State Department, and several dozen who work in the U.S. AID, uh, Agency for International Development, several dozen who work at the U.S. Department of Agriculture, <laughs> and so forth. Um, but also, the program has, over the years, brought political savvy back to the professions. So there are now several thousand alumni of the AAAS Science Policy Fellows Program uh, who are working in science departments, NGOs, government agencies, and doing any number of other things uh, with uh, bringing quite a, quite a reputation to the Fellows Program. Well, when I was a fellow, uh, then as now, there was a terrific two-week orientation program in science policy. How is policy made? How is legislation conducted? What are the procedures for determining funding for research and so forth? And on the first day, we uh, scientists were getting the, the introduction to science policy. And one of the early speakers, actually he was from the Office of Technology Assessment, rest in soul. This was a congressional agency that was discontinued about 25 years ago. Uh, that after 25 years of really stellar uh, service, uh, existence providing uh, uh, assessment and congressional advice on science and technology policy, uh, on, on science and technology <coughs> subjects. And the speaker said, now you scientists have to understand that in Washington, facts are negotiable. <laughs> well, like you, we kind of laughed, except we had just committed a year to working in Washington. <laughs> and we squirmed in our seats nervously. The next day, a different presenter said, you have to understand that here in Washington, we treat facts differently. <laughs> so when you hear about the post-fact era, or fake news, or these other uh, 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 tenuous connections between uh, uh, reality and policy makers, uh, you should understand it's not new. This is not a, just a Trump phenomenon or a recent uh, 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 a, a, a recent discovery. However, I do think that it has uh, developed in the wrong way over the last 35 years. Uh, the United States was by design a very empirical country, both the government and the culture. If you read the Federalist Papers, you'll see that the word experiment or experimental appears in there much more often than words democracy or democratic. 
In other words, these were people who were very much interested in what the evidence says. Um, and I think that ran through our society, but it seems to be slipping. And so now we have millions of people who deny their kids vaccination. And what I find troubling is many millions more than that say that's OK if that's what they want to do. It's hard to have a reasonable, evidence-based discussion about climate change. When I'm talking with younger kids, the most frequent question I get is, do you believe in climate change? And I have to say to them, it's not a matter of belief. The question you should be asking me is, what is the evidence? And whether you are talking about evolution, you know, actually an interesting fact that was published in Science a few years ago um, is that more than half of high school students do not get an adequate treatment of evolution in their biology courses. These are students who are taking biology. Not that all of their teachers are creationists. It's just that it's, well, I guess, easier not to cover that. Um, and I'm not sure how you teach biology without what I would call the central organizing principle of biology. but. Um, there are many signs in our culture that appreciation of evidence and, I would say, appreciation of science. I will use those two words a little bit interchangeably, uh, not quite as one <coughs> evidence as a proxy for science, uh, that there's an erosion in the appreciation of science and evidence. And it's critical. We need to do something about it. Well, when I, a few years ago, uh, four to be exact, or well, five, uh, I announced that four years hence, or one year hence, so four years ago, uh, I was not going to run for another term in Congress. I had served 16 years. I thought the time had come to pass on the uh, representation of this part of central New Jersey. Um, and not knowing what I was going to do, I was pleased that uh, I was given the opportunity to head up AAAS. Now AAAS, and let me talk about that for a little bit, is uh, 170 years old, uh, the world's largest general science membership organization. Uh, in its first meeting in 1848, some disciplinary-based scientists, botanists, geologists, and so forth, got together and said, we need a society to look after the advancement of science. Now, science was hardly talked about. The word scientist was actually a new word that had been around for a decade or so at that time in the 1840s. Uh, instead, people thought about geology and zoology and so forth. But AAAS was founded as an organization to look after the science at large. And our mission now is essentially what the mission was then. Uh, to uh, uh, advance science for the benefit of all people. So it's not a guild looking after the welfare of people in lab coats. But rather, it is an organization that tends to the conditions that are necessary for science to thrive, and that takes this mission of advancing science and expresses it in enhancing communication among scientists and between scientists and the public, uh, promoting and defending the integrity of science uh, and its use. Strengthening the support for the scientific enterprise, uh, serving as a voice. And in fact, in the four years I've been there, I've changed the motto of AAAS from the voice for science to 
the force for science. Um, because we really want to promote the responsible use of science in our society, as well as the support and the ability to do good science. Um, we have programs in science education, science communication, science public engagement, uh, science and the law, science and religion, uh, science and human rights. Uh, the, the sometimes missing dimensions of, of science. Uh, I've talked, I was talking with some of the faculty members about what we do in a not well enough organized way that I'm trying to organize and take as a, uh, uh, take the show on the road, so to speak, a program to offer at graduate schools that touches on the things that we do and that we know about at AAAS. And we would call it, or I call it, what they don't teach you in graduate school. These other dimensions of science that a scientist should know. How is science policy made? How is the budget of the National Science Foundation determined? How do you communicate evolution to a religious community? How do you uh, look at uh, the, the place of uh, uh, the relationship between science and the law? What can science bring to the defense of human rights? Uh, and what must we do to defend the human rights of scientists? Uh, there are very important things that I think you will find critical in your career that somebody has to look after. Uh, and I hope you will. So this is a blatant appeal to join AAAS. Uh, here's, uh, <laughs> students pay as little as $25 to join AAAS. Okay. Uh, uh, Science Magazine is your own subscription to that. This would be a digital subscription. Um, uh, it is worth the price of admission right there. Even if you uh, didn't consider what you get by banding together with 120,000 other people to look after these dimensions of science that might otherwise be overlooked. Uh, we have programs for graduate students. Uh, you probably know the IDP, Individual Development Plan. That was something that originated in conjunction with uh, AAAS uh, to help students uh, plan, pl uh, plan their science careers. Um, the members of AAAS come from all walks. We have 26 divisions, I mean, I beg your pardon, sections of AAAS from astronomy through anthropology uh, and zoology, um, medical science, statistics, and so forth. And we have uh, members of all kinds, including policymakers and librarians and so forth. Because um, there needs to be an interdisciplinary or cross-disciplinary, sometimes non-disciplinary organization. I'm not trying to persuade any of you to drop your membership in ASM or ASCB or uh, 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 ASBMB or, or whatever. Um, but uh, I do want you to be thinking about these other dimensions of science. Um, because you might find that your ability to do the science you love, the disciplinary, uh, experimental, theoretical, lab bench, observatory-based research, uh, will uh, lose its support uh, with this eroding appreciation what science is and how it works. So um, let me ask you then, what do you do? Well, you 
look at um, how viruses replicate, or you look at uh, the microbiome and its influence on uh, 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 human organs, uh, or you look at uh, brain activity uh, and generation of neurons. Well, is that what you owe society, doing good work in those areas? I would say that's not enough. Why do you do those things? Well, certainly they're interesting, and I'd, I'd like to hear from you why you do it. But then I would ask you, well, what do people think you do? I'll bet you get some strange interactions with people. They think you're smart, right? Because scientists are people who excel in secondary school uh, and hence became scientists, and you have to be smart to be a scientist. I think a, a secret that a little known um, secret that we maybe don't like to disclose is that scientists are not necessarily smarter than other people. Uh, that uh, even though they think you are, we are. Uh, but science is a marvelous system for helping people who are have, of ordinary intelligence do very smart things. By doing it cooperatively, collectively, <coughs> Science helps us come to reliable knowledge in a way that we cannot get to otherwise. Um, on any public question, nothing surpasses science's ability to help us get toward reliable knowledge. Now, that's not to say there's no place for aesthetics and faith and other ways of knowing. But for public knowledge and public questions, for half a, half a millennium, the greatest advance in civilization has been science. <coughs> Lewis Thomas, the biologist and essayist, I hope you get a chance to read The Lives of the Cell or Medusa and Snail. He's a great. He was a great essayist. He once said, "Science is the shrewdest maneuver for understanding how the world works." I love that expression. Now, most people think science is what scientists do. They confuse the techniques, the equipment, the terminology, and the mathematics for science. They don't realize that it, all it is is a really shrewd maneuver. <coughs> we could do a better job of sharing the powerful insight that by asking questions so that they can be answered empirically and verifiably, <coughs> You can get to knowledge that holds up. Not perfect knowledge. The process is a little messy. It can be slow. There are a lot of false steps. But it works. Now, it's not a priori true that it should work. Einstein famously said, the eternal mystery of the world is its comprehensibility. It's not necessarily true that it would be comprehensible. The fact that it's com comprehensible is mysterious. And the demonstration that it's comprehensible is that time and again, in one discipline after another, we've managed to make sense of things. Not fully, not completely. It's an ongoing process. Uh, but scientists are devoted to the quest because they observe that it works. So 
what do we do with this knowledge? You see, I think what is important about what you do is not that you can see how viruses replicate or how microbiomes influence organ, brain activity. That's not what is most relevant to the people who pay for your research, the taxpayers. That is not what's most relevant to your friends and neighbors or the citizens of this country. And so when we talk about science communication, we try to communicate what we do in a clear and simple way. Scientists have a way of trying to make it clear, and if it's not clear, just say it louder. <laughs> and make it simple in an almost arrogant or insulting way, as if to say to the public, now let me see if I can make this simple enough for even you to understand. Much of what has gone, has passed for science education has been that. Simple and clear. I think more though, we need to talk about why. And what an amazing insight it is that it's possible to understand how viruses replicate. That it's possible to understand how the microbiome affects human organs, or Drosophila organs, for some of you here who look at that. Um, and we don't talk about that enough. Um, as I fret over recent challenges to democracy, It occurs to me that the cure for what ails democracy might possibly lie in science. Now citizens, I think, um, well we've got a problem with democracy. Uh, citizens are increasingly asserting their values and their hopes and their opinions, which we want them to assert, but they're doing it without any interest, apparently, in finding a shared understanding of how things actually are. And so public <coughs> debate now has not been to try to arrive at shared understanding of how things are, and then expressing your values on top of that, but rather just asserting your opinions from the start. And there are numerous uh, observers who are decrying this. There's a recent book out called Truth Decay. Um, the, uh, the death of expertise the death of truth. Um, observers are, are talking about this, and collectively, I think they are of enormous importance to our democracy. Um, I think democracy is at risk when it becomes just a contest of fervently held opinions, which is what I think it is becoming. And if one opinion is as good as another, each one asserted as emphatically as possible, or even as deceptively as possible, then uh, I think democracy can't survive. And you might say, or I would say, that science, that society is drowning in a sea of unmoored opinions and values. So, 
how do we get people to think about evidence? The citizens, the ordinary citizens who are not professional scientists, won't be helped by simple and clear descriptions of what evidence you've collected this week at, in your lab experiment. Um, it might be interesting, and you probably should try to try to interest them in that. It's in, certainly interesting to you, and it's nice to be able to share interests with people. But 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 but. Um, Democracy requires a citizenry that's informed as well as engaged. And not informed, especially about the details of science. But armed with evidence that they have demanded and that they understand as best they can. That's what they need. Um, for a long time, it was thought that, well, if only uh, they will hand over the, uh, the responsibility for examining the evidence to the experts, and then we will take care of that for them. Um, that's what the experts thought would work. Well, it demonstrably has not worked, and it is a very um, a faulty premise, not to mention an arrogance that is uh, unbecoming of scientists. Um, so when I, when I say that citizenry for democracy to work must be informed, what I really mean is that they have an appreciation for evidence. Now, if you ask members of the public how they feel about science, by a pretty high, with a pretty high percentage, the members of the public will say, oh yeah, science is great. It's important to my life. We should fund it. Um, but you know, don't try to press this too far and ask them, well, what is it? Why is it important? How is it relevant? Uh, but they do approve and trust science and scientists more than most, more than um, most other institutions or most other professionals, more than journalists, certainly more than politicians, uh, but also more than um, most business people and, uh, and others. So maybe we can use that. Maybe we have an opening that scientists, I hope, can find a way to share the admired successes of science uh, in a manner that can lead scientists, uh, lead citizens to embrace for themselves the essence of science. Not to make them scientists, but to introduce to them the powerful idea that asking questions so that they can be answered with evidence has been the um, most civilizing influence of recent centuries, uh, and that it's something for them. It is accessible to them. They can and they should do it. I don't know that this will work. It's a long shot. But it's the only opening I see to address democracy's plight. And I think there's very little time to waste in testing this idea. Whether scientists can use their respect, trust, and approval, superficial as it may be, fleeting as it may be, but real, and
undertake a major initiative to lead people to embrace evidence for themselves, to demand evidence. It won't make them experts any more than you're an expert on glaciology. But you can make a decision about climate based on whether you think evidence has been demanded, that evidence has been well curated, that evidence has been used. And so too can citizens demand evidence for the public decisions that democracy is designed to let them make. So, I hope that we can take this aspect of science and apply it to what I call democracy's plight. What do you think? Could it work? Thanks.
tobacco companies spending a lot of money on disinformation um, really poison, poisoned the debate um, and made it hard to regulate cigarettes. Um, but eventually, eventually, I mean, just look now at the smoking rate. It is way down, legislation limiting it, and where you can smoke, and so that has overcome the disinformation that was put out there by, it's in some cases, the very same people, but using, or if not the same, when not the same people, it was using much the same techniques, the disinformation was put out there on climate. And for climate, we haven't gotten beyond that. And I'm not quite sure how we're going to. Um, okay, let's see, did I see where, oh, uh, uh, okay, we'll go here and then uh, uh, to uh, Gina. Mine's kind of the exact opposite. I was wondering, how is it to, can you teach students that feel so daunted by science in high school, grade school, as well? They see it as this really smart subject that's difficult for them to learn. Yeah, I didn't say it clearly enough before. And that is one of the central points that I would like to get across. And it's, it's a point that I, I, I present to you somewhat tentatively because, you know, people have been talking about educational techniques for centuries, and um, it, it hasn't quite worked. Um, I think, um, you know, a lot of people like to tout the, uh, the revolution in school curricula that occurred in the late 50s and early 60s and throughout the 1960s. It was a result of the National Defense Education Act which was passed when this country was fearful of a little tiny beeping satellite up there called Sputnik. It couldn't do anything but beep, but, but it sent waves of fear through uh, the public and the halls of Congress, and they passed the National Defense Education Act, which, which was intended to create a generation of scientists and engineers like the world has never seen, and they did and they left behind about 80% of the population. If you look at the science curriculum to this day, most of it is to prepare the technological workforce or especially the uh, 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 senior scientists and engineers of the future. Uh, rather than a public that gets it about science, a citizenry that is able to deal with science. So as a member of Congress, all my colleagues would come up to me and say, oh, you're a scientist. You must be smart. <laughs> when anthrax spores were sent through the mail in a terrorist act back in 2001, my colleagues came to me and said, you're a scientist. You must know about anthrax. <laughs> you know, and of course, I scratch my head wondering where in the physics curriculum I missed. <laughs> but they were saying two things that were very important. Science is science. A scientist is a scientist is a scientist. You are the keepers of this arcane uh, set of facts. You have access to them. And I don't, and I never will, and I'll never understand it. Two very important things that they were saying that are really troubling when you think about it. Because members of Congress are smart, for the most part. They're, they're uh, altruistic, hardworking, um, diligent, for the most part. Um, and yet, when it comes to science, and, and they're perfectly willing to deal with and to talk about things that they know nothing about. <laughs> and you laugh, but of course you want them to be able to think about things that they know nothing about. But they can't possibly be expert on everything that they need to know about to help you in your life. So you want them to deal with things that they're not familiar with. To get, to get familiar with, to use it. They won't do that with science. Just like your friends and neighbors. Oh, I'm never very good at science, I can't do that. So we... I don't know whether it dates to the 1958 National Defense Education Act, but I suspect it does. So the question is, 
how do we teach science so that people can use it? Well, I think we start by recognizing and telling them this is the shrewdest maneuver ever invented. And you can use it. And to tell the story of evidence. Every <coughs> single one of your experiments, every single science principle, and I would argue every single piece of science that is relevant to public policy, is essentially a story of evidence. People learn by stories. And if they realize that, gee, this microbiology experiment, this Messelson stall experiment for DNA, this observation of an exploding neutron star, or a colliding neutron star, well, these are more similar than I realized. These are stories of evidence. And I can't understand all the technology and terminology, and I don't want to. But if I wanted to, I could. Um, if we could teach science that way, I suggest, and as I say, I'm presenting this somewhat tentatively because there are a lot of smart people who have done a lot of research on education. But I think we have to say it hasn't been fully successful. Um, so I'm holding out another idea. Tell the story and evidence. Uh, yeah, Gina. So you touched on the answers to my original question, so I'm pivoting a little bit. But so if I follow your theory, uh, well, so you mentioned that democracy requires informed citizens. I think it's kind of a quote from founders, but it's right, democracy, right. It, a quote from our founders. Um, and if public insight into the process of science is what can help drive informed citizens, then what do you think was a major contributor to this loss of insight along the way? Because you seem to imply that it was there at some point, or at least stronger at some point, and it's been lost. Um, it, it was the, I think it's related to what I was just talking about. It was the distancing between scientists and non-scientists. I mean, way back in the 1950s, C.P. Snow wrote a, an essay uh, called The Two Cultures. Um, he said, uh, you know, if you go to a cocktail party and you say, um, gee, I don't know who Shakespeare is, everybody would think you're an ignoramus. If you go to a cocktail party and you say, I don't know what the second law of thermodynamics is, they'd say, yeah, I don't either. <laughs> uh, uh, that these two cultures, you know, were, were even notable, noticeable back then. Um, but I think scientists have reveled in setting themselves apart from, uh, from others. They like to present their material as, um, well, in an arcane way, I guess. It's really, uh, and um, so that um, so many people say, oh, science is not for me, I can't do that. They don't say, well, I'm never going to be a novelist, therefore I don't have to pay any attention to reading uh, or writing. They don't say, um, I'll, I'll, never, I'll never be an artist, therefore I can't uh, enjoy an afternoon at the museum. But when it comes to science, they seem to say, I can't do that. Uh, so, uh, I, I don't know, tell me if you think that's true, but I, uh, I, where did that start? It, I don't think it was always that way. Um, it 
may be as science has become, as the scientific experimentation, you know, as we learn more, to learn the next thing, we need a, an even more involved experiment, even more elaborate equipment or technique. Um, so maybe that's what has done it. Uh, back when, you know, it was just coils of wire and magnets, um, even the people who didn't have the insight that Faraday had could begin to understand what he was doing, uh, and now they can. But I don't think that's it. I think there's something else where partly by the behavior of scientists and partly by other social and cultural factors, we have driven ourselves apart. Uh, okay, uh, here in, yeah, uh, in the pink, uh, yeah, and, and then I'll come over here. <coughs> How do you think we go about having, let's say, a conversation where people are willing to, because you had said something, and I think it was something that I thought of as well, where people, we present these opinions as though all opinions are the same. Yeah. So how do we get past that by, like, and not say, like, because a lot of times they'll have someone who's like an actual expert, and then someone who just feels really strongly about vaccination. How do we, like, not present these as though these things are equal? Well, I mean, that's exactly my point, that um, I, I think that, you know, as, as long as all opinions are equally good and the one that prevails is simply the one that is asserted most emphatically or, as I said, most deceptively, uh, then uh, we're in for big trouble. The only way we can get out of this sea of unmoored opinions is to start mooring the opinions in evidence. And uh, science does that. People recognize that science is good. They don't know that science is good because it moors its opinions in evidence. Uh, but maybe we could make that step and let people know that an appreciation for evidence pays off. And you don't have to be an expert. You do need experts somewhere, but anybody can ask for evidence and should. And so, you know, when was the last time you heard an economic argument? Whether it's about whether tax cuts will pay for themselves, or uh, whether an increasing minimum wage will uh, uh, just be uh, overcome by inflation. Uh, when was the last time in such an argument you heard somebody ask, well, what's the evidence? You know, uh, economic arguments, political arguments, but in fact, almost every argument seems to start and end with an opinion. And uh, that's what we have to get past. And maybe a way to do it is to say, well, you think science is pretty cool. You think it's successful. Let me tell you why it's successful. And you can use that success. <coughs> yeah. Uh, let's see. Uh, OK, the two of you, and I'll take your vote. Right, and I, I, yeah. 
I, I did talk a little bit about American history, but I don't mean, you know, when I say democracy requires an informed citizenry and opinions that are out there swarming, I didn't mean just American. Yeah, I know, I know. Uh, so I'm just trying to make my, my question quick, which is how do we as American scientists contribute to the global advancement of science in that intersection of democracy and science? Like, how do we improve democracy with science abroad? Um, think about our role in that um, context, especially given that like many of our community here in the US as scientists, as graduate students, as higher ed students, are international students who may or may not stay here or be here. They don't know their future. They're just here. Well, we yeah. I, mean, I think it's good to be interested in um, the other countries. Um, I think there's enough difference in culture and in governmental structure and tradition that we shouldn't try too hard to rescue democracy in other countries. Um, it's good to be interested in, in it. Um, John Malone, I saw here somewhere. Um, oh, back there, yeah, Professor Malone. Um, you know, and spend some time on these things, evidently. Um, and, and so it, uh, but you have to do it with a pretty large measure of humility uh, because it's, we have enough trouble rescuing democracy here where we speak the language and we share the culture, um, uh, uh, that we probably shouldn't make too much of an effort to, to apply it. Let's see if we can apply it here, I guess is the way I would put it, <laughs> before we take it, uh, take it abroad. Um, just, I, I fully agree with the path you've described, uh, trying to use science science, but I think we're struggling against, and maybe this speaks to things that's happened in the 20th century in the industry, we're struggling against some very bad social applications. She so just mentioned eugenics in the 1920s as an example, which I think we're still suffering from in mm -hmm. terms of I think social interests. Interesting. Yeah, you probably saw the J.D. Watson Coding Watson, that just came out. I, I didn't see it. It makes me particularly sad because he was one of my mentors in graduate school. I just cringed when feet, feet of clay. Yeah. <laughs> but there, I've heard it on numerous uh, platforms, including in Washington, you know, when somebody doesn't want evidence based science. Oh, oh, yeah. And then they bring up the eugenics movement as an example science policy going on. And I think quite a few of the children in the Pacific Northwest that weren't vaccinated are Native American children, Native American peoples. I did still, yes, yeah. still yeah. distrust. Here there's a measles outbreak in the Portland area. Right now. And they distrust, yes. that's right, exactly. And, and they distrust public vaccination. And this is another serious problem that comes up. People have good intentions try to, you know, present evidence-based approaches, which, as I say when I started, I fully believe that's one of our best chances of, of improving uh, policy and policy application is to have it science-based. There, there's real disinformation out there. Yes. Uh, Particularly and, with and, complex and their mendacious actors, uh, but um, and there are um, the, there is legitimate criticism of science. One of the things we need to be a little bit, or maybe a lot, concerned about is that people who are finding fault with oh, the implicit bias in peer review and uh, replicability or reproducibility uh, crises and so forth in science, that we don't go overboard. Um, those are real. Uh, you know, we've got to stamp out the implicit bias. It's ruining careers for uh, you know, 
a lot of scientists who are women or who are at uh, smaller, lesser known institutions or any number of other biases that, that creep in. But we have to step back and, and say proudly to the world, science is working. Um, you know, with all of these flaws that have to be dealt with, um, it is still remarkably successful. And our, our knowledge of the world and how it works and how people interact and everything else is much more reliable than it was a generation ago or a generation before that. And there are ups and downs with eugenics and ups and downs with, with, with uh, really disinformation about climate science and so forth. Um, and I think if we scientists keep pushing, we can overcome those things. Uh, I, I agree with yeah. I think yeah, I think we always start off our meetings with uh, a similar sentiment. I'm not sure I've given sufficient attention to this. Let's take one more question. Uh, we're, we're pretty much out of time, but we'll take one more question. Uh, OK. Um, let, me, let me take two. This one and this one. <laughs> <laughs> And I'll be around for a few minutes. I do have to fly back to Washington, but uh, happy to talk and learn, learn your ideas. Yes? Well, so I guess I want to follow up on Larry's question a little bit. It seems that there's an inherent conflict of interest in a position like yours, because you're rightfully advocating for science as evidence-based direction for, uh, for the country, right? But also, you're advocating for the means to do that is to increase the power given to scientists, which I think Larry's right, that there are uh, increasing trend of scientists not being viewed as as um, altruistic actors, right? You get people who say, well, they're just gonna go make CRISPR babies because they can, right? So how do you deal with that conflict of interest? And what things do we as a community need to do to deal with that? Difference in power or uh, uh, those issues? I hope I don't seem to be asking for more power for scientists. Um, I really don't think that that's what I'm asking for here. But isn't that I'm asking for ask scientists. For I'm asking for us to find a way to give more power to the people that we have withheld it from. Uh, in the past, uh, it, it is uh, it is to be uh, more forthcoming with our science and more uh, communicative about the empowering uh, uh, the, the, the power of science, and the empowering capability of science. Um, and do you think that can be divorced from? scientists themselves as a community that advocates for their own existence? Sure, I mean, you already, as I said, you know, your, your friends and neighbors don't know quite what to make of what you do. They don't quite know what to make of science, but they think that science is pretty cool. The, the, the opinion surveys show that over and over again, consistently over decades. So let's use that foot in the door that we have to share the science in a way that empowers people. Uh, not to seize more power for ourselves. But we already have their respect and trust up to a point, for more than most people, uh, more than most professions do. So let's try to use it. Yes. I think the uh, major opposition to science is financial and industrial support. For issues, for example, like gun control and uh, endocrine destructive pollutants in the environment caused by the production of plastics and, and detergents by big companies. Um, the interesting thing is for, 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 for guns, Pardon? for guns, there's not a major, um, you know, uh, military industrial complex. Uh, it, but it, but there has been a, effective distorting influence um, 
for endocrine disruptors, it's a little bit different. Uh, a lot of that is, you know, I'm not sure how much of that is done by deliberate poisoning of the environment and how much of it has been done by ignorant poisoning, poisoning of the environment. But it's certainly true that somebody... So is it safe to be DEP and EPA? Yeah. But they're not. Yeah, but they're not. That's right. So what do so, you say? Well, I think that is an example of corporate influence. And as I say, I don't know how much of that is, is malicious. Um, I don't know. Okay, I think uh, we're actually well, thank over you. time. So.